Uh, I've been working in Windows most of my career. And uh, about four years ago, I moved to a place that works on Linux. The transition was quite hard. Um, a lot of cheese moved around. And a particular pain point was linkers. A lot of the behaviors that uh, both myself and the Linux guys around me took for granted were very surprising to me. Oh. And so this talk is quite literally the talk I wish I could have attended four years ago. Uh, the title is not entirely accurate. I will not be discussing everything. Uh, I wish I, they told me about linkers. I will also extensively mention loaders. I will focus on shared libs. And in particular, emphasis about woo, uh, Windows and Linux diffs. Uh, it's not quite as catchy, but it's more accurate. Uh, and note that there will be some uh, overlap with Anders talk from uh, yesterday, maybe, I don't know, 30% of the talk. But given the complexity of the topic, uh, that's probably not a bad thing. My name is Ofek Shilon. <laughs> I'm a senior developer at uh, Toga Networks. And uh, the best way to reach me is either via mail or uh, LinkedIn. Uh, let it be said that uh, I'm not a linker developer by any stretch of the imagination. So feel very free to challenge my understanding and the views that I express in this talk. Right, let's take a nano introduction to linkers. In the C++ build model, uh, we start with source files. At the first stage, the compiler processes them into object files. Object files are nothing more than containers for sections. Uh, there are various code sections and various data sections. Uh, code sections contain machine code, uh, data sections contain all sorts of data. At the second stage, the linker, well, it does more than one thing, but uh, the first thing it does is pulls together uh, identically named sections from various object files and concatenates them to one uh, large section in the resulting binary. Another thing the linker does is it reorders the sections so sections that would require identical permissions at runtime are adjacent on disk. This bunch of adjacent uh, sections that require the same permissions is known as a segment. And this is a view of the binary that is useful for the loader. In the third stage, the loader, uh, when the program starts, maps the separate segments to separate memory locations on page allowed boundaries, and afterwards sets the uh, page, the memory page permissions accordingly. Uh, code sections typically contain many calls, many function calls. In the simplest case, the calls are from the binary into itself, uh, but that is not the general case. In general, uh, the process uh, also loads shared libraries into memory. The executable can make a call to a function that is implemented in a shared library. This shared library can make a call into a function implemented in yet another shared library. Uh, arguably, the main task of both the loader and the linker is to properly wire these calls. Uh, shared libraries are called... Um, uh, SOs for shared objects on Linux and DLLs for dynamic load libraries on Windows. I will try to use the general term uh, shared library for both. Um, I will try to use the term binary to say executable or shared library. Most of what I say goes for both. Um, please feel free to catch me if I make a mistake. So uh, how does a naive view of such call wiring look like? If uh, your code includes, this is pseudocode, a function foo that calls into bar, uh, this is, the name bar isn't written in the code section on the binary itself. 
the way this is encoded is a call instruction with an address of an all zeros. This is a placeholder in the binary. The binary also contains a section generated by the linker called reloc. This is for relocations. Relocations are small recipes for, uh, for the wiring. Um, of the form, of the general form, find the function bar, and when you do, uh, overwrite this placeholder with the, the address you found. This is not the truth, but we will progress towards the truth in stages. Right, uh, that concludes the crash intro. Uh, let's dive into some more details. First, in Windows. A Windows executable contains a section that describes the imports named as iData. Imports is uh, uh, the term to describe the libraries that the executable uh, advertises that it needs to pull in, that it, that it depends on. Uh, if we look into the uh, iData section contents, the main structure inside it is called a directory table. It is a table of directory entries, one per DLL. Each directory entry contains the name of the DLL. It contains a reference to an image lookup table, uh, which is essentially a, a list of either names or indices indices of uh, symbols to uh, import from this DLL. Uh, maybe I need to mention uh, the term for function or global variable is a symbol, uh, not with global, uh, variable used. And after the loader uses the data in the import lookup table to resolve the symbols, it uh, places their address at the import address table. It's one import address table, but each directory entry contains an offset into it. Um, if, you, if you're already familiar with Linux, this is a very rough analog of the GOT, but I'm getting ahead of myself. Uh, let's say a word about how this iData is populated and used. When you build a DLL in Windows, Let's say uh, this DLL exports a function. This is how it looks like in Windows. The function f is decorated with decal spec DLL export. That makes the function uh, available for consumption by other binaries. And this, is, this causes an entry to be formed in the e data section, e for export data. <coughs> This entry is just an executable stub that all it does is jump to the real implementation. But also, when you build a DLL in Windows, another binary is formed, which is a static lib called an import lib. It is static, meaning it is intended to be merged into the executable. The linker performs this executable it performs this merging into the executable, uh, thereby adding to the executable an import stub that only jumps to this export stub. And it adds a directory entry to the uh, iData section. At load time, the loader uses this entry in the iData section to locate the DLL and link it into the executable. That is, find the appropriate addresses and write them into the IAT, into the uh, import address table. So the full route of a call in Windows is a call to F from the executable is actually resolved by the linker into this import stub which jumps to the export stub in the DLL, which jumps to the real implementation. These two extra hops are just jumps, so the return actually returns to, uh, to the caller of this F. So the, the main takeaway from this jungle of details is that in Windows, a binary exposes 
uh, one interface per library. A Windows binary tells the world I need uh, to find this lib and use these symbols from it. I also need to find lib2 and use these symbols from it. Let's take a first look in Linux and see that this is not the design there. A Linux binary contains not one, but two import sections. Uh, they're actually rather poorly named, but the first one, the dynamic section, is just a list of library names. The second one, dinsim, dot dinsim, is just a list of symbols. So schematically, a Linux binary tells, advertises to the world separately what libs it needs to pull in and which symbols it needs to use from any of these libraries. This is not limited to executables, of course. This goes for uh, shared libraries as well. And uh, an important thing to note is the search order for these symbols. When resolving the symbols for a shared library, by default, the executable, uh, the program's executable, is searched for these symbols first. Uh, certainly before these dependent libraries, but even before the library itself. Uh, this behavior can be controlled with some uh, compiler switches, the B-symbolic switch family and the dynamic list family, but I mentioned them here for completeness. So I will not go into more details about them. So schematically, uh, Windows uh, binary tells the world, I want to import this lib and these symbols from that lib. And uh, uh, Linux binary tells the world, I need to import these libs and to find these symbols anywhere inside them. Now, you can see already that this opens the door for some interesting uh, games. Uh, on the downside, if uh, two shared libs implement the same symbol, then uh, the symbol might not be resolved from where you intended it to be. On the plus side, this might be intentional behavior. Uh, you might want to uh, override, say, some, an, a function from some third-party uh, vendor with your own implementation. This design is one of the factors that makes this possible. More on this soon. We need to discuss position-independent code. That's a term you meet a lot in uh, Linux documentation and uh, online discussions. Um, uh, it's easiest to start with uh, this describing what's non-position independent. The, the simplest form of a call one can imagine is a call to some fixed address. This is not position independent. If this binary would have been loaded at a different address in memory, uh, this uh, call address uh, would be invalidated. Uh, Luckily, this doesn't happen. This is actually technically impossible to do in, a, well, not in a single instruction in X64. Uh, another form of call one can imagine is a relative offset. A call can be made to a fixed offset from the current program counter, from the current location of execution. This form is position independent. If this binary would have been loaded elsewhere, nothing in the code needed to change. And this is actually used for hidden symbols. So this is used, but actually rather rarely, uh, regretfully. Uh, the main form of position-independent code is as follows. Uh, a call is being made into a fixed offset within the GOT, the, the global offset table. This is a section generated at load time by the loader. And it contains a list, of, the loader populates it with a list of resolved addresses of functions. 
So uh, the call is made into the address stored in this slot in the GOT, and the execution uh, is, uh, is directed to the same place. Please note, and this confused me for a long while, uh, this entire binary is not position independent. If this entire binary would have been loaded elsewhere, the contents of the GOT uh, needed to be different. But the code section is position independent. Uh, like the proper way to read aloud position independent code is position independent code. This, is, this was like a major design goal in the Linux universe. And, and the reason is, I think the entire uh, design of ELF system, of uh, uh, Linux-like systems, is uh, heavily biased towards libraries like libc. If uh, you write a shared library that is loaded by hundreds, many, uh, sometimes thousands of processes on a server, if all these libraries uh, have identical code pages, then uh, actually in physical memory, these pages are shared. There is only one instance of this section in physical memory. But in this sense, shared libraries are shared. Um, this is the main form of uh, call used by Linux binaries. Note that the discussion so far was about uh, imported or exported functions, but this flow of a call holds also for um, calls internal to the binary. There's a reason for that. More on that soon. And that still isn't the whole truth. But hold on to your seats, we're getting there. Um, shall I discuss this? Yeah, uh, continuing a small discussion that started at Anders talks yesterday. Uh, all uh, shared libraries code in uh, Linux is position independent. This is not optional. Uh, yet, um, you need to specify uh, a certain switch to compile for position independent code. I think it should have been implicit for shared. Shared cannot work without it. If you try, uh, to link into a shared library object files that was built without this switch, uh, I get uh, this link or error telling me exactly recompile with fpick. Uh, that should have been the default, I think. There are two similar switches for fpick versus fpick, and uh, they, uh, there is a small difference only as far as I could find yesterday, only on Alpha and Spark uh, architectures, they have some built-in hardware uh, for GOT-like usage, and it is limited in size, and these switches bypass this uh, hardware device and do the GOT entirely in, uh, in hardware, in software, sorry. Uh, there's also a distinction between FPIC and F. Uh, PIE, position independent executable. Um, uh, for most of the history of uh, ELF systems, executables were loaded at the same address they were built for. Then ASLR uh, uh, was introduced, and now executables should be able to be uh, loaded anywhere. And the technical difference between them, well, I put a link to another uh, presentation here. I won't discuss this, but which is uh, a way of saying, if you can understand this, please explain it to me. <laughs> <laughs> right, let's say a word about resolution time. In Linux executables, Resolution is checked at link time. A Linux executable would fail to link if it couldn't find any of these symbols in the specified libraries. This is not the case for dynamic libraries. Uh, in dynamic libraries, uh, Linux is very happy to link them without searching for these symbols. Um, 
the switch that controls this behavior is allow schlib undefined, allowed sh allow shared leads to use yet unresolved symbols while linking. And for completeness, I say that you can intervene with this behavior with no allow schlib undefined or some other rather delicate switches that I won't get into here. So what do we know so far about Linux? That was a lot of details. Symbol and library dependencies are listed separately. By default, all calls are indirected through the GOT. By default, resolution in libraries is deferred to load time, and the executable is searched first. Uh, this collection of facts um, has some far-reaching implications to developers. And let's look at a few. Here's one. How can we form a process-wide singleton? A singleton, I mean uh, either data or code. In Linux, you just put it in the executable. And wherever you use it, uh, this is where the singleton's implementation is picked up from. This is where the definition is searched first. In Windows, it's not so simple. If you want a process-wide singleton, you need to plan for it in advance. You need to link all your binaries against a single DLL that implements this singleton. Here's another implication. Can you have circular library dependencies? Sorry. Uh, that is to say, can we have a shared lib A that imports some symbols from lib B, and in addition, lib B imports some symbols from lib A, or some longer cycle? In Linux, the answer is yes. You don't need to do anything special for it. Uh, I remind you that uh, by default, shared libs are built with allow schlib undefined. Resolution is postponed until after loading, where all the implementations in all libraries is available to the loader, are available to the loader. In Windows, uh, the computer says no. In Windows, um, well, technically you could, but you'd have to hack pretty hard to get there. In Windows, um, by design, the answer is no. Now, um, you know, in my, pre in my previous work, we actually used that. We had like, um, we worked on Linux and we had a rather large code base and we partitioned it into shared libraries rather uh, arbitrarily. Uh, we did this to... Um, to improve link times. We, we parallelized the link. We didn't link our entire code base uh, in, uh, into one executable. When, when something changed, we needed to relink only the neighborhood of the change and not the entire thing. This is common practice. But as a result, uh, tons of circular dependencies were formed, and nobody cared. Uh, and despite me personally uh, enjoying this design, I actually prefer the Windows approach. Um, I don't like a design that encourages me to be sloppy. Uh, I would, if we would have worked on Windows, it would have forced us to invest thought into the layering of our shared libraries. I think it would have benefited us in the long run. And uh, in recent days, I discovered that I'm not alone in this opinion. Uh, here's a quote. This, uh, largely undefined, is an unfortunate default for shared. Changing it may be destructive today. Uh, Mac and Windows have many problems, but this may be a place where they got right. This is a quote by Rui Uyama, uh, the venerable author of both the LLD and Mold Linux linkers probably the most uh, knowledgeable person in the world today about Linux, about Linux linkers. Right, here's another implication. I think this is the most important one for developers. Can a shared library symbol be overridden from an executable? N now, the 
terms overridden and uh, overloaded are are heavily overridden and overloaded <laughs> um, so so the a different term was introduced to to describe cross binary overriding this is typically called interposition uh, so can a, a shared library symbol be interposed from an executable in windows the answer is no which dependency is described as which symbol to take from which library you have no wiggle room there um, well, you can do something, but not from the executable. To do such interposition, you'd have to relink all your components against some DLL that implements your desired interposition. And even then, you won't be able to replace the implementation in the original library, which implemented this symbol. The wiring was already performed there. In Linux, the answer is a resounding yes. If you put a symbol in the executable, it will interpose uh, other implementations of this symbol, unless you build with some exotic build switches. Now, there is a canonical example where uh, this overriding behavior is useful and even required, uh, that is new. Uh, here's a quote from the C++ standard. C++, a C++ program may provide a definition for any of the following uh, memory functions. And now there's a list of uh, flavors of new and delete, uh, uh, aligned, unaligned, uh, scalar, array, uh, placement, I don't know. And the program's definitions are used instead of the default versions supplied by the implementation. Now, we will return to uh, this very clause at the final slides, but reading this at face value, we can say that this is not what happens on Windows. On Windows, uh, the program's definitions of new and other memory functions cannot be used instead of the default versions supplied by the implementation. Windows does not conform. Okay, next, let's discuss lazy binding. In Windows, this is called delayed loading. This is the practice of postponing the resolution of function addresses until they are actually called. Uh, the motivation is that uh, if you have a large library, it can expose tens of thousands, sometimes hundreds of thousands of uh, functions and typically the large majority of them uh, are uncalled. So by binding only at the first call time, you avoid doing resolution work that goes to waste. Uh, this is a potential substantial saving in load time. In Linux, this is the default. In Linux, all uh, binding by default is lazy, lazy binding. The easy way to intervene is in this behavior is with an environment variable, ldbind now, which changes the behavior system-wide. In uh, Windows, the default is no. Lazy binding is not the default. Uh, it is a late addition to the Windows uh, build tools. And a lazy bind delay load can be added with a linker switch setting a particular DLL to be delay loaded. Now, let's discuss how delay loading is implemented in Linux first. Recall that uh, this is where we left off in our um, pursuit of the true flow of a call in Linux. We said that the call is actually a, an indirect call into an address stored at a fixed slot in the GOT. In reality, uh, another actor takes the stage here, and this is the PLT. PLT is an executable section generated by the loader. And in reality, a call is made into 
a fixed offset in the PLT. Uh, the first instruction in this PLT slot is a jump to a fixed slot in the GOT. Now, eventually, this slot would contain the address of the function to be called. But initially, this is not the state of things. Initially, the address in the GOT for this slot is the address of some place that performs the actual resolution. Incidentally, this some place is the next instruction in the PLT. It doesn't have to be, but it's a natural place. So the following two instructions in the PLT uh, set up the arguments and call to the loader to perform this resolution. The loader is still loaded into the process, but this, we are not in load time. This happens at the first call to the function. Uh, after the loader performs its resolution, it overwrites this uh, address at the slot for the got. It overwrites uh, the contents with the true address of the function. So from the second call onwards, the flow is a call is made uh, into the PLT slot. The PLT slot jumps into the uh, offset set in the got slot. And this location is actually the real implementation of the function. Uh, now, I omitted some details. This is not entirely accurate. Um, uh, th this index is actually an index into another section called the reloc PLT that I didn't mention. And there's actually an extra jump to the first entry in the PLT. None of that matters. This is pretty much as far, uh, as close to the full truth as we'd get uh, in this talk. But I want to take one other small step. We need to talk about comparing function pointers. Here's another quote from the standard. If you compare functions, if the pointers are uh, both null or both point to the same function, uh, yada, yada, they compare equal. Uh, when I first saw this, it struck me as very odd that this even needs to be said. Uh, of course, that if two pointers point to the same function, that they compare equal. But after learning about the PLT, it actually struck me as very odd that this is even possible. Uh, recall that actual calls are made into the PLT entry. And uh, if you have two different binaries, say an executable and a library, the calls are the call addresses are in fact slots in different PLTs. Eventually they would jump to the same implementation of the function, but the actual call address isn't. Another thing needs to happen to make these pointers compare equal. Um, perhaps I won't go into the full details, but um, what happens is that uh, to make this comparison possible, we use another section, another very important section that I didn't mention so far, which is the symbol table, the dot sim tab. The linker uh, puts an entry for a function in the symbol table. And at load time, the loader populates it with the address of the PLT for that function in the executable. If the address of the function is taken from anywhere in the program, any binary, either the executable or some shared libs, um, the address uh, resolves into the value of this symbol in the symbol table. This makes all function addresses of the same function compare equal. And this is for Linux. Let's discuss Windows again for a bit. 
I recall that uh, I told you about the iData section that uh, the main structure is a directory table with a directory entry per DLL. Turns out that there, there's an entirely separate hierarchy for uh, delay load DLLs. There's another struct called a delay load directory table, and these two do not communicate at all. Um, so, in fact, uh, in Windows, if I uh, import a function from a delay loaded DLL, the address of the function before calling it is different from the address of the function after calling it. Yeah, these are two different functions. <coughs> so, a, a pointed to a, a function isn't even equal to itself in the same binary, much less to point into a function in different binaries. Um, so, at least in the presence of delay loads, Windows does not conform uh, to this clause in the standard about function pointer comparisons. Okay, we have time to discuss symbol visibility. In Windows, uh, you can decorate a symbol with decospec exports, which marks it as exported. It adds it to the e-data section. You can also decospec a symbol as imported. This doesn't, uh, this isn't what adds the symbol to the i-data section. Recall that this addition to the i-data section is done by statically linking the executable against an import lib. Uh, it, what it does is a minor optimization. It uh, saves an extra hop uh, that I didn't discuss, and it happens in release anyway. But I still think it's a good idea to keep these declarations around. Uh, most symbols, but by default, a symbol is neither. Neither exported nor imported. By default, a symbol uh, is internal to the binary. On Linux, uh, this is much more complicated. In Linux, there are no analogous decorations like import or export. In fact, in Linux, there is no such distinction between import and export. Linux has a distinction between public symbols and hidden symbols. When a symbol is public, it goes through the longer PLT got route, it performs these two extra hops, and it is available. It is visible by other libraries and executables, essentially exported. And since it goes through the got, potentially the loader can intervene and place in the got addresses from other binaries. So potentially it is imported. Default visibility in Linux is public. If you don't do something special, all symbols in your binaries are both imported and exported, and go through the longer call route. You can do things to change that. Uh, the most famous one is F visibility hidden, which changes uh, the visibility throughout uh, uh, your link unit. You can also control individual symbols with attribute visibility, either hidden or default. And there are other switches that I mention here for completeness. Now, I want to read this quote in its entirety. Using this feature, Visibility Hidden, can very substantially improve linking and load times of shared object libraries, produce more optimized code, provide near-perfect API export, and prevent symbol clashes. It is strongly recommended that you use this in any shared objects you distribute. Anyone cares to take a guess where this quote is from? This quote is from the GCC man page. Uh, hidden symbols were a late addition to the ELF design, I think. And uh, it's, I think it's pretty safe to say today that there's a wide consensus, even among uh, Linux uh, compiler and linker authors, that this should have been the default. That this is another case where Windows got it right. <coughs> 
Um, okay, I will skip this. Uh, I'm not sure I have time to discuss the loader. I, I'll say something briefly about the loader. Uh, we mentioned it quite a bit, but it's not at all obvious what sort of entity is it and where does it lie. So um, the loader is a component that goes by many names. You sometimes see dynamic linker or interpreter. In, in Windows Docs, you sometimes see image loader. It runs in user mode as it has to. I mean, its primary function is to uh, load shared libraries into user address space and overwrite some entries in tables in this user space. And uh, on, my, on Linux, this is a file. On uh, my Linux machine, it is LD Linux x86 64 SO2. The, the, the uh, more, more common term is LDSO. That's the term for uh, platform agnostic loader. Uh, on Windows, this is a logical component. Uh, it is essentially all the APIs in NTDLL that start with LDR. Um, I want to leave time for questions, so I won't discuss the broader architectural context. Right. I do want to dedicate the remaining time to discuss what C++ has to say about shared libraries. Um, anyone knows or, or anyone has an opinion of what the C++ standard has to say about shared libraries? Nothing. 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 Yeah. Um, sorry? Um, it doesn't even say that. It doesn't even say... Uh, uh, I think the more accurate description is uh, whenever you mention shared libraries, the C++ standard goes la la la, and I can hear you and runs outside the room. <laughs> the C++ standard pretends uh, to live in a world where no shared libraries exist. Um, and I'm uncomfortable with that. Um, this is again uh, uh, one of the clauses of, from the standard that I showed earlier. Uh, the program's definitions are used instead of the default version supplied by implementation. Now, I, uh, I did try to ask online uh, to collect opinions about this, to, and people tried to save the dignity of either the standard or Windows with various answers. And yes, the, the most common answer was shared libraries are out of scope for the standard. This was the common phrasing that I came across. And the reason I'm not comfortable with this answer is that I don't even understand what it means. Uh, does this mean that C++ code that you build into a shared library isn't subject to the standard? Uh, 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 that's a lot of code already, but maybe I think people mean by it that if your C++ program imports shared libraries, then maybe that is undefined behavior. Um, Mind you, that's virtually 100% of the programs. Uh, maybe with a few exceptions in the embedded world, all programs use at least libc. Uh, so if the standard makes uh, the presence of shared libs cause undefined behavior, then the standard is not very useful. I, I hope we can do better. Um, Another discussion that I came across, um, well, actually, that I was involved in, try, uh, notes that the notion of a program is not defined. The notion of an implementation is not defined anywhere in the, pro in the standard. What, what does an implementation consist of? Does it consist of a compiler, maybe a compiler and linker, maybe a compiler and linker and loader and an operating system? Uh, 
looks like the design of the ELF format or the design of the PE format, is that, does that constitute a part of an implementation? Um, nobody knows, and I actually think these cannot be defined properly. And uh, I cannot think of any definition that would uh, save the dignity of the standard. So, uh, personally, uh, I think that this bull needs to be grabbed by the horns. Um, either Windows needs to change a bit or the standard needs to change a bit. And Windows cannot change. This would break the world. So, uh, when looking at clauses like this in the C++ standard, they are very, very clearly dead letter. The way this is phrased is not how the world works, and it never will. Um, so, I think the pragmatic thing to do is to drop such uh, clauses from the standard altogether. Uh, their only impact of the world is to have us mumble to ourselves nonsense like uh, shared libraries outside the scope of the standard. That is the only impact of these clauses. Uh, uh, I mentioned two, replacement function and function pointer comparison. One can argue that the function pointer comparison is a violation only in the presence of a uh, delay loading in Windows, uh, there are probably some other of such offending statements in the standard. <coughs> and I submit to you that the only way to make the standard legally applicable to real world programs and not to an imaginary world programs where shared libraries don't exist <coughs> is to um, drop these statements altogether. Right, uh, I omitted a lot of stuff. I leave, I'm leaving here some breadcrumbs for the curious. I did not discuss the details of relocation at all. That's not so bad because Anders did discuss them uh, at some detail yesterday. If you haven't still, uh, uh, I urge you to watch his talk later. I didn't discuss weak linkage or versioning. I didn't discuss ways to control the, the granularity at which the linker and loader operate. If you, if you change a section, section's uh, definition to include individual functions or individual symbols, there are many, inter not so many, but there are uh, potent optimizations that the linker can perform. It can uh, remove a ton of duplicities in binary code and it can uh, uh, eliminate code, uh, function code that isn't being used. And I also di didn't discuss linker scripts, which is a uh, very interesting topic by its own. I'm uh, leaving here uh, links to the main uh, resources that I used uh, when researching for this talk. I put a PDF of uh, uh, the slides with all these links already at the disk, at the, um, Discord channel for this talk. I want to point out in particular uh, Michael Kerisk, until recently uh, the owner of the Linux Man Pages, who holds a online work an online workshop specifically about shared libraries in Linux. That's a three or four day workshop, and uh, I. I'm afraid I didn't take this one, but I took another one of his workshops, and uh, based on that, I'm sure it's great. Uh, Michael was also kind enough to review an early draft of these slides and gave some uh, useful feedback, and uh, I'm very grateful to him for that. Okay, yes, uh, this is what most of what I intended to talk about. If you have questions, I would love to try and answer. Go ahead.